I think I share the challenge with um, my fellow moderators that distilling the kind of rich um, series of presentations for the Friday morning is what I'm reporting on. Um, both the keynote, the panel, and the two case studies um, is quite a challenge. And so it's going to be very important as you listen to this, to my report out and others to, as Christina said, to, to look really for the gaps. What's missing that struck you that you think should be part of the report? And that's really what, um, so this is a very, very early draft, I guess, um, in that regard. So I just, um, I think, yeah, you've got, I, I have five points. <coughs> Let me take the most you can get, I guess. Um, and just there's uh, two um, groups of these. The first two, I think, I thought I, it was good to put in some observations and f essentially findings. <coughs> so um, the first is just a remark that the cultural landscape concept has proven adaptable and useful in a wide variety of settings and contexts around the world. I think we saw a lot of examples of that. And I think importantly, what it seems to be doing is providing a shared language for many of us to understand that we have something in common when we talk about cultural landscapes, but that they take so many forms and so many different values um, associated with so many different cultures. And that, that really this um, has an impact on what we all and others consider heritage, and that there's the flexibility with this concept that really seems to allow some innovation and evolution. Um, so I think just pulling from a lot of those experiences, um, I think we've, we've got something that seems to be working for people. <laughs> Secondly, we talked a lot about um, you know, actually getting that terminology into a lot of official um, regulations, policies, conventions, and how that really brings people to the table to talk about this concept. Again, I think we're seeing a, an approach here that's inclusive and reliant on local leadership. We're talking about different voices speaking for these places and traditional knowledge systems and institutions, I would add after this morning. Thank you. Um, so those are really the two, and I, I have to comment because I thought there were on World Heritage context that there's a lot of experience there, and there's much experience at the national and local level. So we're getting quite, um, I think Susan used the word robust, um, description of what we're really talking about, even though it's quite a broad category. And I thought I was particularly struck with the importance of this work at the local level, because that experience is feeding up and influencing the World Heritage Convention and the way it's implemented, and I think that's, that two-way street that Susan mentioned, I think, is particularly important that we remember the influence there. The last three I'll try to do quickly. Um, and I, I did borrow a little bit because I think uh, this first idea of this language of using cultural landscape framework or process is um, also starting to catch on. And I think we're moving from, as Nabucco reminded us, typology or process, and we may be getting language, and then later Christina commented. So I think working on that language is going to be important for us. Secondly, um, lots of ideas on what we really need to develop good practice. Um, Letitia reminded us we have some work to do on the nature culture, and that was <laughs> repeated a number of times. I think governance has come up. And also, how do we link, and I think these last few examples of climate change, how do we link to these larger issues? And the final one, I think very relevant here at the university, is really finding ways to do capacity building, engage the next generation, and we're very happy to have all the students here uh, working with us uh, this weekend, and just to think of creative ways to sustain that collaboration over time. Cultural landscapes, the results of a long and complex relationship between people and nature, are with us today because of the past and present day stewardship of these communities, living in and near them. They are places of ingenuity and innovation, of mystery and spiritual power, of learning and healing, of conflict and coexistence, whose complex array of cultural and natural values, tangible as well as intangible, are not readily understood for the, by the outside visitor or manager. 
Understanding requires honoring the worldviews and core values of the communities that are or were their stewards over different periods, listening to diverse voices and perspectives, and respecting the different knowledge systems and practices embedded in these places, which have much to teach us about resilience. Um, I go then into five bullets related to supporting indigenous and local communities uh, in sustaining these landscapes, and that these will require new partnerships that take into account the need to sustain the core values underlying stewardship. We heard from Teresa about tradition, language, respect, and love. And today we heard from Merv about other values of the Polynesian Voyage Society uh, that I wish I could have included here, but we can add them in. Um, and ensuring that these are reflected in education of the next generation and translated into policies affecting these communities. We need to reinforce the central role of communities, not only in management, but in governance, whether as governance by communities or in collaborative relationships, and, and manage adaptively, as we heard from George. Honor the importance of distinctive spiritual relationships to the land, enshrined as a human right by the United Nations and the associated traditional practices and sacred places that are held in trust for the living, the dead, and the unborn. Uh, we need to recognize traditional knowledge systems and institutions, I added that this morning, alongside Western systems of science, ensure that it informs management policies and support communities in transmitting this knowledge and associated practices, such as indig indigenous languages, foodways, tools, water management systems, and handicrafts across generations in way that, ways that foster identity, pride, and sovereignty. And finally, we need to support and develop livelihood opportunities, recognizing the dynamic nature of uh, the context of globalization in which these landscapes sit, so that young people have the option of living in the communities they come from. Some of the comments that he's uh, put down coming out of the Saturday morning session, and I will add a few comments from today, uh, because there are some themes. Uh, the massive urbanization of the last generation has gotten cities out of balance with new growth areas, large movements of migrants, deterioration of centers, pressures for greater density, tourism development, and so on. The Hull Initiative is responding to this breakneck urbanization worldwide, which takes different forms in different places, and asserting a conservation and landscape uh, set of ideas as a basis for better modes of urbanism. Confusion and conflict over the term cultural landscape persists. Its original use as a way of looking or a, quote, mode of experience is somewhat at odds with the use of cultural landscape as a piece of territory to be mapped and become the object of particular policies and discrete treatments, um, like a conserved object. Cultural landscape thinking is a progressive ideal that has made a large impact on conservation thinking recently, and we should try to re not try to reduce it to just another kind of object to be conserved in traditional ways. In practice, the categories and hierarchies of social groupings meant to collaborate through the Hull process, communities, um, nation states, and so on, cannot remain fixed and separate. They need to be broken down to allow new forms of partnership and collaboration to take place. This kind of political reorganization of planning and decision making has to reflect uh, different cultural patterns to create a framework more aligned with landscape-inflected urbanism. And I think um, Fausto and Merv and others uh, sort of emphasize that question of how do, how do you define culturally um, relevant mechanisms as well as uh, what is the content of their work. Uh, Hull is promoting the integration of heritage concerns within Main Street urbanism. How will heritage concerns compete with or cooperate with other driving forces in urbanism such as social, economic, political, and environmental drivers? And how will we redefine a sense of, quote, the good city, or, quote, sustainable urbanism with conservation at the center of it? This is one of the key strategic and communication problems to be solved in convincing other actors and decision makers that the Hull framework makes sense. So on the way forward, he's, uh, Randy suggested two things. One is to clarify terms and assumptions embedded in the Hull recommendation, particularly the use of terms such as landscape and cultural landscape. And secondly, to highlight successful cases of conservation-centered urbanism that also abide by the cultural landscape ideal and its holistic approach, its participatory and democratic processes, and its long-term vision. 
Though our panel was looking at cultural landscape from the ground up, the first speaker showed, I think, that uh, flexibility still exists within the tools that might be seen as top-down. In other words, the National Park uh, traditional regulations and rules have been flexible enough to sustain the traditional use of cultural landscapes, enabling traditional owners to live on the land and practice uh, their way of life. However, I think especially from the subsequent sessions, more ways of listening and hearing traditional owners' advice and knowledge systems is still required. The second point came from World Heritage designation, encouraging, for example, the, the entire Kenyan nation to respect the Kaya elders and seek their advice on ongoing management of the sacred and fragile landscapes. And I think that case study could be repeated in some other designated landscapes. The issue of large land scale landscapes that are treasured and valued by many people requires that this admiration is directed towards creating a variety of partnerships uh, for their ultimate sustainability. Um, we then had an example of um, local populations in a very large scale landscape, the Val de Loire, where a million people needed to understand how to translate outstanding universal value so that they would accept a management plan and its policies on the ground. And I think um, that point of translation of a plan into policies that the local population understand is a key issue. We were also fortunate to have an example from um, Colombia of indigenous people who are happy with their traditional way of life um, and could keep their sustainable community if there are no illegal and external interventions. I think I've got that point right. <laughs> um, and then our speakers, um, the problem of defining cultural landscapes, entre chien et loup, has not been properly solved. The concept is still confusing. The image of the wolf and the dog is wonderful at dusk. <laughs> there are many, many paths, um, many ideas, but Additional tools need to be developed, including listening. I think we got a lot about that this morning to, to follow on to this point. So cultural landscape is an approach and the concept which was considered a bridge over the existing gap in 1992 is today part of a major paradigm shift. It has influenced and helped be a guiding positive beacon, I think, on uh, local landscapes and for the people who are trying to manage them. And our last two speakers also showed how um, to retrieve traditional knowledge in Turkey or even in the Presidio. Thank you. Those of you in the design world know when I say that this was like being in a charrette. <laughs> um, so Yoela and I sat down immediately after that. And much like in a charrette, we came up with some big ideas uh, kind of building off this morning's session. And we have five of those for you. Clearly, this needs much further kind of digging down and drilling down. The first is clearly for the need for much more study, knowledge, investigation, and dissemination of that information about climate change. Really doing all those local studies. We saw some of those today, but we need to do more of that. Uh, it was also very clear to us that when we took a look at those five presenters, the need for local response to this global context, uh, maybe being a little bit of a child of the 60s, you know, kind of, taking local action, uh, thinking globally, acting locally, but in many respects that was actually quite clear that we do know that climate change will vary from location to location and even though it is a global issue, it is not affecting every location, every cultural landscape in the same way and I think that was very, very clear today. Um, the recognition um, of both local, again, local natural systems and local cultural systems, as well as, and I think Jane and others just said this, local community values, and not always viewing this through a Western lens. I think that was, again, a very, very important message that we heard today and, and the importance of that. Um, fourth is the need for much better coordination between cultural landscape studies and climate risks uh, people, climate in risk interest groups or studies as an example of the need for much greater interdisciplinary work about this. Um, I have been very influenced by local ecologists in Oregon who I work with who have taught me a great deal about climate change even though their interest is not in cultural landscapes. 
And last, the need for flexibility in future response to the impact of climate change on those cultural landscapes, having some kind of global policies, national policies, regional policies, but understanding that they, we will, given the uncertainty that we heard about this morning and that we know about, uh, about climate change, the need to be flexible in our response uh, to, to those occurrences. So thank you, especially to Yoela, for her great work on this. And we did just want to thank the repertoires. We didn't acknowledge them, and so just wanted to acknowledge their hard work as well. Catherine, Brian, Lauren, Adi, and Joella. You know, uh, Nora mentioned the language of cultural landscape. I think, uh, you know, what I want to add to that is that uh, there are many communities who understand their own co uh, their cultural landscape. It's within their beliefs and uh, whatever, so it's already understood. That is, for me, the language of cultural landscape, not what we call, now want to start to invent a new language of cultural landscape. And the other thing is where uh, Professor Melnick, whenever he talks about cultural landscapes, climate change, etc., I think there should be coordination also with traditional knowledge systems so that they can get mainstream. That's it. I think there needs to be greater uh, integration uh, between cultural landscapes and intangible heritage. They're just, to, to me, they're, they're just about synonymous, and I, I, I just need to get these things together. I just wanted to bring one set of strand of scholarship to the uh, attention of the audience that was going on that parallels directly with the HUL initiative that came out at the same time in the context of the Marine Protected Area Federal Advisory Committee. There was a 20-person cultural heritage working group that involved, I think, 12 indigenous groups from Hawaii to Alaska in between and a variety of other perspectives. And we developed a white paper on applying cultural landscapes to marine protected areas. And the conclusions that we come to, largely independently, although there's some overlap with the scholarship, are, are strikingly similar. And this issue of coasts being vulnerable, coastal peoples, and its place in the ocean has come up. But I think we need to think about that even more. And there is some good work going on. Thanks. I think it was a truly international uh, span in terms of history and region. I just want to point to one very important lacking, and that is the consideration which uh, very tangentially uh, Professor Tano pointed out to, the difference between nation building and national identity. And I'd bring attention to the new nations that emerged after the Second World War in the context of West Asia, absolutely not covered, and a big, I'll put it in terms of hazard. According to UNESCO, 65% of the world's heritage lies between the Fertile Crescent and the Nile Valley. Only 70 of the world's 900 plus sites are located in this region. There is a reason for that. And I think that it is very crucial that we see this hazard as a very important issue, not only in a light with what the nation, national identity construction is doing as a hazard to this condition, but also with the rising of the Arab Spring, the more than natural disasters, the human-made disasters are having on the, uh, the effect they're having on these sites, which will never be inscribed, and they're already in a minority, even though we know majority is there. Thank you. Monica and I looked at the Ferrara at breakfast yesterday, and uh, I just wanted to note a couple of things. One, I think the relationship and interaction between the charters and the conventions and declarations came up in the discussion, and none of the moderators actually spoke to that. At least I didn't hear it. Um, so I think maybe there's some work to do on these interrelationships of charters and conventions that tend to parse the world out in pieces, and we need a little more integration. Um, Strengthening cooperation between natural and cultural heritage institutions was a huge theme, and I just want to highlight that again. The third and last is promoting lessons learned in cultural landscape work. And in that, I would just suggest to you and offer 
that IFLA Cultural Landscapes Committee created a website four years ago with best practices, short case studies, and if everyone at this conference did one, we'd have another 100. Mm -hmm. So it's iflaclc.org, and we have a short best practices form, and it's meant to be an international tool. So perhaps in talking about that kind of outreach, we could say there's already some vehicles and we need to use them more. Mm -hmm. The natural folks are setting up a whole uh, forum for the large landscape practitioners and they have, you know, lots of resources and we need to just jump on board with them. And also the National Park Service uh, in their call to action is looking at the scaling up and they are also developing uh, toolkits and um, other information. So those are two opportunities that we should just, you know, again, insert ourselves into your and uh, get some practical your partners. Your Thank you. Your blog, your blog. Oh, and, uh, well, of course. <laughs> 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 yes, and I do have a blog, uh, The Living Landscape Observer, uh, so please uh, join me and I will be blogging back to you. The conference is a wonderful contribution for the Florence Declaration of Landscape. And I have read on the paper that in 2012, uh, 2013, it is a an international forum for the safeguarding of landscape. So, um, so I think that fin, so the question of resilience is one of the key points to be studied to assure the safeguard of the landscape. So what I suggest is organize a contribution next year uh -huh. in Val de Loire uh -huh. uh, about that point. And, uh, and uh, we, you, you will be welcome, of course, to just to, 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 to contribute yeah. about that point especially. Because uh, I think it's, it's very important to, uh, to, to clear that point in order to um, uh, make, to, to assure uh, a, a real safeguarding of the landscape. As the toolkit is developed and case studies come around, I'm really looking for um, examples of participatory budgeting as a way of um, increasing transparency. So um, I'd love to read a case study on that. Um, let's see. Uh, relocation is another like theme that I'd kind of like to, you know, I don't think it was really addressed here. And um, to what extent you know, the HUL initiative is going to address the politics of relocation. And then I guess um, as we talk about livelihoods and heritage, I'd like to see kind of a gender dimension in that in terms mm -hmm. of how heritage is kind of breaking gender boundaries or if it's reinforcing those. Mm -hmm. So I look forward to reading. One of the important things coming out of this meeting, and which I hope will be a theme through the book is the importance of people in capital P E O P L E. And yes, it's up there. But it reminds me, I just wanted to, I just wanted to pay um, you know, tribute to <laughs> Richard Engelhart from a number of years ago drawing attention to this. And he said at a conference in New Delhi that we've moved from the focus on the three capital P's in cultural heritage of princes, priests, and politicians to people, <laughs> and that's so important. We should draw more attention to indigenous knowledge, and we should uh, try these agencies, UNESCO agency, to have a, a way of capturing that knowledge. Yes, I know sometimes it's very difficult to get the message that they have, but I think it's some effort can be done in that, I think through intangible cultural heritage or something like that, but uh, there's lots of knowledge in, in, in this indigenous people that we should keep in mind for all these cultural landscapes. I think we've been speaking about people and their identity and with in relation with landscape, but we haven't talked a word about their right to landscape. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important and that we are not speaking only of people, but of the happiness of people, mm -hmm. happiness mm -hmm. of people living in the landscape. Mm -hmm. What has come out, I think, very clearly is, uh, from the whole um, section was 50% of the world now live in urban areas. But that means 50% live in rural areas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 <Yeah>. <laughs> 
critic. <laughs> but, I, and, but I think, you know, we need to <laughs> raise that profile of landscape and cultural landscapes and particularly rural landscapes and articulate the, the, the particular challenges of rural landscapes. But how do we do that? And I think what came out very clearly from the uh, presentation on climate change is what can the cultural heritage, uh, cultural landscape community offer? What can, how can we set out our stall? Um, how can we be there uh, at, at the right tables to, to, to put across these messages? Because I think at the moment we're not very good at perhaps doing that. Mm -hmm. And then if we do get an opportunity to sit at this, these tables, what are we going to say? <laughs> and, uh, and I think, I think uh, the, the sort of key messages that came out, I think Fausto said, um, sustaining cultural landscapes sustains local identities. Mm. And it sustains resilient communities, as we've just heard. And it contributes to quality of life. These seem to be sort of fundamental messages that should be in there somewhere. It seems to me, as I'm listening to all this, that we're really moving toward talking about something that is about um, a lowercase world heritage. And there is some, some intersection with the World Heritage Convention somewhere here, but it is a limited intersection. And I think that's uh, something which perhaps another, another conference or two um, will, will explore. Uh, looking at these words up here, but also reflecting upon my sitting in on this interesting and very useful conference, one word that I think is missing there, and I've remarked on it several times to several people, is the word politics. Uh, how are you going to do it? You've got to do it through politics. And I, we're now in the United States of America, which has rejected UNESCO, at least officially, as a government. Uh, I think we've moved away from it. Uh, we may be talking about it here, but at least as far as the United States government is concerned, we're obviously not a part of UNESCO. I thought that was true. But anyway, excuse me, that's what I was informed. The word government is up there, uh, but I think along with communities, You've got to articulate with the communities your policies, where policies is up there. And that articulation comes through politics. And somehow, I think the group has got to play the game of politics. Now, I'm sure it does, and does very effectively. But it needs to pay attention, I think, to that articulation of the policies with the government and the communities through political action. And I don't, I don't know quite how you do that. I don't know whether you can still maintain your 501c uh, credentials, <laughs> how it works in the academic environment. I'm an academician too, but that interaction, I think, is, is, is crucial to the whole thing. That's the success of what I want to have happen too. Thank you. I see the word education, um, but it seems a bit small when we think about the scale and from children mm -hmm. all the way through the process, indigenous peoples, Politicians, <laughs> if we can educate politicians, who mm -hmm. knows? Um, but I really think, um, say, just broadly, the role of the academy, not as a silo, but institutional, international conversation. I'm sorry, I, I must say for the record, since this is on the record, <laughs> that the United States is a member of UNESCO, wants to be a member of UNESCO, is continuing to be a member of UNESCO. Unfortunately, at the moment, we're legally prohibited from paying our dues. The one thing that I missed, maybe it'll come in this afternoon's field trip, is some sense of connecting to the very local site where the conference is taking place. You know, we didn't we didn't hear very much about New Jersey and the way in which the heritage <coughs> is handled here and maybe in future conferences uh, that connection could be made more strongly. I, sh I should say that at the uh, at 145 Preservation New Jersey will be conducting a bus trip which is a tour of uh, historic areas and canals in New Jersey and they've taken over that aspect of the conference. So at least we haven't ignored New Jersey itself, a cultural landscape entirely. Aboriginal sovereignty still has to be dealt with. We don't have a treaty in Australia. Um, I know a lot of indigenous communities don't have that around the world. It's something that has to be brought into the framework of everything. Um, those who remember the Kanawinka Geo Park exercise um, from Australia, um, I met one of the people and they um, told me a story about the Australian government running up to them saying that, that the Australian government's sovereignty was threatened by UNESCO. Mm -hmm. 
the poor Australian government, yes. So just to have that in the framework as well, to be mindful of and to work with. I think a lot has been said already, but I was thinking on, on the role of conferences uh, like this, because I came with questions, and I have gained a lot of possible answers to it. So I was thinking on the role of research and the role of universities, and I was actually looking at the words, and I realized that actually research is in there, but tiny. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an, it's an important part that we need to emphasize, is the role of research to continue uh, so that this work continues to move forward and that we gain more insight on how to move forward. I wanted to uh, kind of uh, lead a call for more study in resiliency and cultural systems, uh, specifically as they relate to the tangible aspects of cultural landscapes because of all of that. I, I don't see the word cultural landscapes across the front of it. I see everything that speaks to the fact that it's a process as much as it is, you know, a concept uh, that can de delineate space and, and aspects of that. Um, so in terms of telling the story, we have to look at all of the attributes of the story of outstanding universal value and what leads to that, but also the processes that underlie those physical things that are the cultural systems that help sustain and then increase resiliency in terms of climate change. So that's all. I just want to interject that I think one of our points was that's a great point and we agree that that to integrate natural systems and cultural systems that was one of the points that we had you think just to add to the idea of politics um, the idea of the separation of nature and culture conservation is, is very embodied in public policy it's not you know it, we haven't integrated um, so if there's a way for a UNESCO to help you know help that process coming down to the local level would be very helpful. Thank you. Так, ещё раз спасибо всем. Я хочу от имени мастеров, наш таджикский мастеров подарить небольшой подарок уважаемому организатору, профессору этого мероприятия. Uh, thank you very much once again, and I would like to present uh, a gift from the uh, artisans of our community to the organizer of this conference, Professor Ar Archer St. Clair. <laughs> wonderful and remarkable and I feel like we've worked as a community um, to, to create a, a, a sense of um, synthesis. I think for me what struck out um, was the sovereignty issues, the human rights, um, and obviously some of the politics that maybe we hadn't um, you know, gotten into quite as deeply. So I think thank you for, for those. Those were new, new and important concepts. Okay. Well, so many things. I wish I could have those extra 20 seconds that Nora had left over, but <laughs> um, I, there are some indicators uh, that are being worked on in one context, and the COMDEX uh, was mentioned in George's presentation, uh, indicators of resilience and socio-ecological production landscapes through the Satoyama Initiative. So not to reinvent the wheel, but it's a, it's a great point. Um, resilience is obviously a big theme. Um, I, I think the, the point about rights is important, and uh, there was a very short mention about the human rights uh, in my comments, but not adequate. And I think that um, this idea that Monica mentions of right to landscape and to happiness uh, converges beautifully with Buen Vivir, uh, or Summa Quasse, that we heard of uh, from Fausto, which is really well-being. And the intangible and spiritual is um, really being taken on board uh, greatly in the nature conservation protected areas community, uh, including in the book about sacred natural sites that Ken mentioned. I just wanted to pick up on what Nalini said. I think the question that the language of cultural landscape already exists in the community is part of not just human rights, but uh, social justice. I, I think. Part of what I hope comes out of the Cultural Landscape Initiative is a new way of listening to voices, uh, giving equality to every human voice, and that idea that Merv had mentioned that uh, 
in the end the cultural landscape exists in the mind, uh, is part of achieving social justice through uh, that listening to uh, and giving equality. And I, so I, I think that underlay some of the things, but the word social justice never came up. And I know for our students, the minute an instructor comes in, we have a heritage planner who says the reason I'm in the conservation field is because I believe in social justice. They sit up. That's what makes it, they say, this is someone we're going to listen to. Um, I think aside from the practical um, examples, we need a way to publica publish and communicate these. We've got all the charters. Language might be confused, but I think a case study of positive and negative examples of local communities seeking justice, seeking to stay on their land, seeking to come back. Um, I think these are the critical things and it's very difficult often for communities to get access um, to things that are often in the, the major institutions or in the academies. I mean, I think that's a real challenge and that's one of the things from the 20 extra points that have come um, that reinforce, you know, the case studies that were presented through our panel. So I really make a big plea for that, better, better publication through all sorts of media of these examples. We've had so many here that are new. That's what's been so fantastic. Thank you. I don't want to repeat what my colleagues just said, um, but I do agree with it. But I do want to say that um, from a very personal note, when I think about why I'm involved with landscape preservation, and I heard it throughout this week in other language, I think it's because there's an essential human need to place ourselves in both time and space, mm -hmm. to know where we are, where we've come from, where we are physically, where we've come from, and where we are going. And to me, that's the, the, the underpinning of why we engage in landscape preservation. And, and educating more people about that, everything, I think, as Jane just said, the extra 20 points, 20 um, notes that were just made from all of you are just superb. I was taking careful notes, I think we all were. So I wanna, uh, I've got 17 seconds. I wanna thank you all very, very much for what you've done yeah. this weekend. And I especially enjoyed all the conversations in the hall over dinners, over lunches, and just kind of getting to see old friends and meeting a lot of new friends and new colleagues, which has just been great. So thank you very much for that. The one thing I did want to, want to say is that while I've appreciated the applause, um, I'm not the one who's made this conference a success. It's you. It's the speakers, the panelists, the moderators, all of you who have made it a success, who have come from really a great distance in many cases to spend what could have been a beautiful weekend outdoors. <laughs> in here engaging these issues and I think that's been terrific at every level so I'm really happy that uh, I think the conference has been a success in that way that we have talked about interacted and engaged many of the important issues but I want you to know also that uh, putting this conference together was very much a team endeavor. And the members of the steering committee, again, were the people who guided me and helped to find the best people we could possibly find to try to put together a program that would bring together different groups of people and create this sort of interaction, collaboration that's asked for in every convention and so seldom achieved. As many of you have stated, we all tend to exist in our silos and rarely come together. And I think an event like this makes that possible. The third reason for this conference's success is again not me, but the students and the past CHAP students who came here and from other uh, schools in Rutgers as well. But those who came here and helped and they're the people who really made this work. And I think we ought to applaud them all. And you. <laughs> so I wish you all safe trips. Uh, thank you again for coming. And we will keep working on this and try to get something out and up on the website 
as soon as we can. But we'll wait to hear more from you about your comments. Thank you.